These uh, protocols for biliary atresia. Uh, Dr. Thapa, who is here, uh, would tell us about, uh, has already written about this uh, Indian Pediatrics Consensus on neonatal cholestasis, that is uh, in 2000, where this was the chart that has been uh, advised by them, which says the same thing you do, jaundice, urine, bilirubin, refer to you do the LFT and look if the child is sick do all the work up for metabolic and infective causes if the child is not sick look at the stool color the most important look at the stool color if it's pale color you need to do ultrasound liver they have mentioned liver biopsy as the first uh, step and then if liver biopsy shows biliary atresia a, or no excretion or hydra you do a lacrotomy and you do an intraocholangiogram if it, they are yellow stools you just do a liver biopsy. Now this is the consensus of Indian pediatrics. It's a very useful consensus, very useful algorithm, but in clinical practice there may be some situations where you may not be able to interpret the, uh, apply this algorithm. As Dr. Sudarsani said, you need an extremely good pathologist to interpret those slides. And as Dr. Rekha pointed out, if you already have enough evidence that this is an obstructive jaundice, you can straight away go for an intraoc cholangiogram. There is similarly a guideline for evaluation of cholestasis in infants. This is recommendations of the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, where again they have said about the consensus that after you screen for hypothyroid and galactosemia, you consult the GI, get the complete workup done including ultrasound, metabolic workup, infective causes, and then you consider percutaneous liver biopsy, you do a scan that is a HIDA scan, aspirate or an ERCP. So they uh, are still not recommending an invasive procedure for diagnosis of biliary atresia, but we are not in America, we are in India. And maybe we need to follow what Dr. Edgar and Dr. Sane has said, that we need to interpret it with caution. We need to apply a liver biopsy as a diagnostic test for, with caution. You need to be in touch with the pathologist who is going to interpret the report. You need to be in constant touch. You need to yourself go and see the slides and then maybe decide whether you're going to do liver biopsy as a first step or you're going to do intracholangiogram as a first step. Uh, we've kept CDs in your folders which have a topic on this approach to neonatal cholestasis and we put an algorithm of what we follow at our hospital, Dr. Raker, and uh, what we do at Vadia. So that is one algorithm that has been useful, which we have found useful at our center. But similarly, there may be some things that you would find useful at your center. Uh, so this is the same, the cholestasis guideline recommends that a liver biopsy be performed in those patients and interpreted by a pathologist with expertise. Uh, now the limitations of uh, liver biopsy that uh, Dr. Sudha Sane has pointed out is the most important, it's pathologist dependent. You need a pathologist who is extremely good in interpreting the liver biopsy. Again, neonatal cholestasis is an evolving disease, so interpretation on a single biopsy may be difficult. In fact, we've gone through case reports where some centers have done six to seven liver biopsies and finally picked up biliary atresia. So it's not necessary that one uh, biopsy is going to tell you yes or no. Uh, they express over a period of time, and early, ex uh, if you've taken it early in the course of the disease, you may confuse it with neonatal hepatitis. Uh, Dr. Aker, you've been telling us about HIDA and you would base your uh, intracholangiogram on the basis of HIDA. How reliable is it? Well, if the HIDA is, uh, if the contrast, uh, the agent is not excreting into the intestines, after it is done appropriately with phenobarbitone priming, and after 24 hours, you know, on a delayed film, if there is no contrast in, in the intestines, then that is quite significantly, uh, you know, that, that then uh, that interpretation uh, is uh, perhaps doubtful of a liver, medical liver disease or a surgical. However, on the other hand, if the contrast is documented in the intestines, then that is one of the surest signs that surgeon could be out of the picture in that child. Have I made myself clear yes, or should yes, you want me to repeat it? So that's clear no. that... If you have excretion of the tracer in the intestine, it rules out a biliary atresia. But if you have no excretion, it may be biliary atresia, it may not be. It all depends on how the uptake was. So if you have a tracer which is excreting, you rule out biliary atresia. So it's, uh, it's helpful in negating biliary atresia, but it may still not be useful for positive tests, though it is 
something that can still help you as you go further into your investigations. Dr. Aker, uh, so biliary atresia sensitivity is high, but specificity is low. And in this child, five months, there is already hepatic dysfunction. So tracer may not have been taken up and we didn't get any excretion. So we are not sure whether this child's HIDA, no tracer excretion was actually because of biliary atresia. What about the other tests? We've been doing, uh, talking about duodenal aspirates. There have been reports of MR, that is uh, MR cholangiogram. There are reports of endoscopic cholangiogram. So what is the role of all those for diagnosis? Uh, well, majority of my work of uh, biliary atresia is done in Vardia. And uh, to be very frank, uh, I, I find it uh, negative on two counts for doing expensive tests like MRCP. Uh, first of all, the affordability of our patients is a problem. And secondly, it delays my uh, treatment. Okay, so I do not undertake any of one of these three tests. However, I agree with you that there are reports confirming and negating and there are some people who believe in putting in a duodenal tube and looking at bile in, and there are positive and negative outcomes of these tests. But personally, if you ask me, I don't do either of these three tests. I base my diagnosis on clinical suspicion, biochemistry and uh, ultrasound and hydra and then proceed with the intraoperative volume. Right, so uh, Dr. Edgar has given a very valid and practical suggestion that duodenal aspirate, MRCP, ERCP, there have been reports of being done. Yeah. I have one question. Do you believe in doing bile salt and pigment in stool sample? It is a simple test and instead of going for a bile aspiration and things. Right, we, can do that. we have been doing that, but what we found that even with neonatal hepatitis or any dysfunction, we usually don't get that. So it, we don't find it very useful in doing those tests. But you are depending on clay colored stool, right. whether it is traced on outside right. and uh, Quantitative estimation of bisalt pigment in stool will be of use. Dr. Alkaja, what would you have to say for that? Actually, the estimation of stercobilinogen. The quantitative estimation, the facilities are not available actually. That's the problem. We have not been, I mean, uh, any, uh, uh, maybe anybody else, but I really do not have the experience with it. The so quantitative estimation, yeah. we don't have the normal set standards also. We have been doing that stercobilinogen in school, uh, stool for lots of patients and we found it not to be useful. Uh, the problems with duodenal, we've tried duodenal aspirate. The problems with that is you need to put the rice tube into the duodenum. Sometimes the tube may be in the stomach and you'll get nothing and you'll say, oh, this is biliary atresia. Sometimes the uh, tube is coiled up and again you'll say, oh, nothing has come, so this is not biliary atresia. So it's a duodenal intubation. So that's difficult. Test is cumbersome. You need to remove the aspirate every two hours for the next 24 hours and see whether any of the aspirate is having uh, bile in it. So this is a cumbersome test, not very useful. MRCP, the problem is you need general anesthesia, deep sedation. There is very little experience of MRCP in neonates in, in uh, Mumbai and India. So this test still it's standardized. We are not recommending this as a routine test for diagnosing of biliary atresia. ERCP, you need a scope that will go into a neonate. You need again a general anesthesia and there are chances that you may not cannulate the bile duct. So this is one problem with all these tests. So though they are really hi-fi, non-invasive, they still cannot be recommended because of its limitations in neonates. Now, in this child, percutaneous biopsy could not be done. He was five months. He already had a coagulopathy. In spite of giving repeated fresh frozen plasma, those parameters were not getting corrected. So, a uh, percutaneous liver biopsy could not be done. However, he was taken up for an intra cholangiogram and there was no dye excretion. So, our diagnosis was biliary atresia. Uh, what should be the treatment here? Now, we, we've got biliary atresia in this child. Dr. Raker, how should we treat this child? Well, since the intraoperative cholangiogram has demonstrated uh, complete uh, obstruction of the bile ducts, then the recommended treatment, uh, even if the child is five months, is uh, a Kasai porto entrostomy, which uh, essentially involves taking down a removal or excision of all the extrahepatic bile ducts, including the gallbladder, making a roux loop of intestines which is about 40 centimeters in length and joining the roux loop of the intestine to the portal plate and uh, this surgery 
uh, roughly takes about two and a half, three hours. Uh, it uh, is uh, not a you know uh, risky kind of venture, and we proceed under the same anesthesia, and it has got favorable results in about 40 to 50 percent of the patients. Right. So uh, you would recommend doing a cathartic uh, surgery in a child with biliary atresia, and. Uh, on what basis would you tell the parents how successful the surgery is going to be? That's a good question and it's a point of debate for a long time. Now, uh, there are a lot of prognostic markers that have been identified and written about. But to me, I think what it boils down to a few issues. One is the age at which the surgery is done. So if the child is uh, referred early, is diagnosed early and is operated within two months of age, then the outcome is more probably successful. So I think that's a good prognostic indicator. The second indicator is uh, the macroscopic appearance while we are doing the surgery. Now when we are operating children with biliary atresia, uh, surgeons who are familiar with that area could identify these patients into two groups. One where there is a lot of inflammation around the portal plate and the whole biliary system looks inflamed. That has got a better outcome in prognosis. And these are the patients, according to me, do well with immunosuppression with steroids subsequently. How, however, on the other hand, macroscopic appearance of, at portal entrostomy, if it is a fibrotic kind of biopsy, which looks like it is a burnt out phenomenon and these children subsequently are not known to do well. So this is the second good prognostic indicator according to me. The third is the look of the liver. Sometimes we operate them early and the liver looks more normalish. It is never normal but more normal. Okay? However, if we get them delayed by about five months, the liver looks absolutely cirrhotic. Okay? That has got poor outcome. And of course, there are histological features to base it as a prognostic marker upon the size of the bile ducts. Less than 250 micron bile ducts are known to have poorer prognosis outcomes and more than that are having better outcomes. And the other and smaller component of biliary atresia patients is what is called as Bayesian syndrome. Described again by uh, Mark Davenport from King's, this is biliary atresia and splenic malformation. It constitutes about 10% according to literature, but according to our experience, it may be lesser than that. But this is biliary atresia with polysplenia, asplenia, preduodenal portal vein, and situs inverses. So, if such syndromic variants of biliary atresia are there, then their outcomes are poor. So, these are the markers that I feel are important. Yeah, so we've got a lot of prognostic markers. The most important here is the age of record. This child came at 5 months. Most of the patients in our uh, center are coming at three, three and a half months by the time where liver damage has already occurred. So most important is the age of record. And the last but not the least is the expertise of the surgeon who is operating. So Dr. Aker will smile at that and we go on to the next one. This child was, uh, did undergo cathartic surgery but he already had a cirrhotic liver and he died post-op at eight months of age. He underwent cathartic at five months, he died at eight months of age. He had all the poor prognostic markers that were present. He was referred late, he was operated at five months, he already had hepatic dysfunction, ascites and all that. So obviously we expected that he is not going to do well. Uh, Dr. Alkadrada, last question. What are the other drugs that one needs to give? What about the multivitamins that one needs to give in these patients? Actually, it's, since it's a medical surgical fusion, we, surge, surgeons always tell us that fine, you know, you operated and fine with it. Now the ball is in your court and the child comes back to us for a periodic medical opinion and we really need to follow them up. Actually, there are two issues. One thing is where we have to really monitor uh, the liver function so that uh, we, we really have to keep monitoring these children so that they don't develop the consequences of chronic liver disease. And the thing is, uh, for that we have to give them the vitamin supplementation, which means A, D, E and K, these fat soluble vitamins, which we need to uh, give them at least in the 10 times the normal recommended dosages. There are various regimens, either you give them daily, some people, uh, 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 daily in these recommended dosages, or the vitamin A is given monthly with vitamin D every weekly. So we, depending on which regimen you want to follow, 
but water soluble uh, vitamins are preferred to be given on daily dosages that is what we prefer and we give it along with that to, uh, to reduce the pre pruritus we definitely give phenobarbitone 3 to 5 mg per kg along with uh, hosodeoxycholic acid around 10 to 15 mg per kg per day in three divided dosages people have recommended cholestyramine and uh, this is about managing as far as uh, medical management is concerned we keep the nutrition aspect and the diet where we definitely for the breastfed babies we continue with the breastfeed but the children who are on complementary feeding we definitely recommend protein intake of around 2 grams per day of good quality proteins and adding the medium chain triglycerides to the diet so that the absorption of the fat is enhanced the third thing is we keep a watch on the complications like we see that uh, they do not go into the means if they are developing the arthritis definitely the salt restriction and managing it with the potassium sparing diuretics then we keep a watch on the with the help of ultrasound to see whether they are going into the portal hypertension and keep a watch on them so that they don't bleed so easily and we manage to preserve them till we prepare them for the liver transplant and apart from that actually if we really try to find a hepatic cause the uh, uh, we try to find the infectious cause so like supposing if it is cmv hepatitis then we have to yes, definitely treat cmv in the next session so. okay so treat accordingly yes. that's yeah. fine the most important is going to be nutrition giving multivitamins that is fat soluble vitamins in 10 times the recommended dose because there is no bile they are going to there is cholestasis they are going to have malabsorption of fat soluble vitamins so uh neonatal cholestasis is an emergency please refer patients on time we don't want patients to reach up to liver cell failure and death do not ignore jaundice in children more than 15 days of life always check the color of the stool yourself work up for obstructive and non obstructive causes and please do early refer and that's the end of the session and